talked about four or five times. We know that we've worked together, I should say, our history and academically for years, 15 years now. So you're in the same department that Manchester, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, so we wrote a book called Y was equals MC squared, which is a very focused, easy book to write, in which we derive e equals MC squared. In this book, we wanted to do something similar with the quantum theory, so actually do calculations. And we started it about four or five times using the sort of traditional approaches. But in the end, we were led to what is essentially an approach down to Richard Feynman, so called the sum over histories approach. Where, where, so you ask the question, a very simple question. You say particles are particles for a start. They point like things when you detect them, they're particles. So it's a theory of particles. So you, you ask the question, if I sit a particle there, then where is it at the next instant? Then how does it move, or does it stay where it is? Well, the simple answer is if you put it exactly there, then it has an equal probability to be anywhere in the universe at the next instant. And that's a, that's a very anarchic thing to say. And really what quantum theory is, is just narrowing that down a bit. But actually the strangeness, in fact, so, says that. And, and the everything that can happen does happen idea is that it, it not only is this particle that starts out, you know, I know that there's a particle here, in an instant, that particle is equally likely to be here, or here, or here, or here. And in fact, it's more than that. It's, it is all in all of those places at the same time. It's a, a particle has become still one particle, but it's one particle in more than one place. And so, all uh, of those things happen. So everywhere that particle could go, it does go. So it means, for example, that when we do our calculations of what's going to happen at the Large Hadron Collider, when we're calculating the likelihood of making a Higgs particle, then what we have to do to do those calculations, so we've got to calculate, well, it could be produced this way, or it could be produced that way, or this way, or that way. And in fact, usually there's an infinite number of different ways that the particles could arrange themselves to make this Higgs particle. And we have to, the calculation says all of them happen. They're all happening at the same time. Each one gives us a number, and then we add the numbers up, and that tells us what the chance of making the Higgs particle is. So if we leave some of them out, we'll get the wrong answer. And that's been happening for years and years without that kind of physics. We wouldn't even understand how an atom works. What, how big does this particle have to be? It can be is it a theoretical particle or a real particle? They're point-like, point as far as we know, and they're point-like in the theory. So, and that, that's a, an experimental fact, as far as we can tell them. Out. So we don't know how big they are. They're, they're point-like, as far as we can tell. So, so it's true point-like, so they've got no size. But is the world made up of this? Yes, yeah. you are. I mean, I mean, I mean Particle physics over the 20th century discovered that there are, well, there are 12 particles of matter, and we've discovered them all, so arranged in, in three families of four particles each. So you're made basically of the first family, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, and that's it, um, and as far as you're concerned. And they behave according to these rules. But what's interesting is you can, th this is our best theory of everything in the universe, other than gravity. So, so you know, quantum theory, I think, is often Mainly the way it's taught at university as well, it's a subject. But in principle, it, it is our best description of the way that the world is built and how the building blocks of that world interact with each other. So it's an important theory to understand in that sense. And if that's the case, should, you said it's taught in university, should it be taught in schools? I mean, there, there's, uh, I think you're from various schools, aren't you? Are you taught quantum theory? No. I mean, should it be taught to... Is it so fundamental to everything? Well, I, I, it, it, look, it, it, doesn't get any, it doesn't get any easier to, to get your head around the idea that a particle can be in two places at the same time. That doesn't, you don't benefit from being old. So, <laughs> so that idea could be introduced to, to, to younger people. And the laws, the rules of the game, and the basic concepts that underpin quantum mechanics, and this is something we try and communicate in the book, are really simple. It's like an elaborate game of chess. Particles kind of pop around and they can branch as well. But that's about it. Particles can hop and branch, exploring all the things that they could do. And if we keep track of all the possibilities, and just do the sums, then I mean, that, that, that's it. That's, that's pretty much what I do all the time when I'm just trying to work out what's happening at the LHC. It's, so so I, I think that uh, a lot of the basic thinking could be, uh, 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 school kids could be exposed to that. And it, 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 uh, it that would give, it, it, it kind of help us not to, I mean, we see the world around us and we think things are as, a, you know, we think things are at definite locations. The world is as it is. This is teaching us something very different, right? It's, it's making us realize that, that really we shouldn't be so blinkered or biased in the way that we think about the world. That kind of hump message is an important message generally, I think. You know, we should be. Do you, do you so, well, it's also, it's an important 
lesson, I think, in how you think scientifically. Because you can, you can express all the problems and the, the road to the solutions in quantitative in one experiment, which is actually I'm unveiling a plank, which is why I'm dressed up rather more smartly than usual, <laughs> um, to, to Thompson, to um, George Thompson, George Paget Thompson, who at Aberdeen in 1927 did a very famous experiment called diffraction. It showed that electrons diffract. In other words, the, the, sort of the, the best way you can describe the experiment, not precisely how he did it, did it but it's to imagine two slits. And you fire an electron through the slits, and you have a screen on the other side, you have a piece of a photographic plate, essentially. And you ask the question, where did the electrons land? And you find that they don't land, as you might think, just a, roughly where the slits are, but they form a stripy pattern called the diffraction pattern. So over time, it, one electron at a time can send through, and they'll build up a diffraction pattern which is exactly the same way that light does or our x-rays behave. Now, in that is contained all the problems, all the challenges, and all the information you need to build a theory. And this is what we do in the book. Essentially, if you get a pattern like that, one electron at a time, it means the electron has to know about both slits. It has to behave like a wavefront. And it's quite obvious, in a way. If you get a wave going through these two slits, and you, and you block one up, then obviously the pattern, the wave disturbance on the screen, would be different. It's the same with an electron. An electron behaves like that, but it's a particle. It's a point-like thing, and when you detect it, it is always in one place or another or another. And that's all you need to know. So I think at you know, GCSE and A-level, you can explain that. And the fascinating thing is, you have to take the experimental data seriously. You have to say, this is what the experiment in 1927 told us, you repeated many times since. Therefore, we need to jettison our common sense view of reality and build a new theory. And that's, a, that's important. Do you understand, though, why we could struggle to get our heads around this, this stuff? It doesn't, it doesn't sort of make sense. But, but that's one, the, the thing is, though, that the reason it, it would be useful to teach it, I think, at school, is because it's a very good example. Of, it doesn't matter what your preconception of the world is. You look at experimental data, you build a theory that explains the data. That's it. And once you've got that, then you're a scientist, you understand the basis of science. The dangers of extrapolating into regimes where you've no, no direct experience teaches you that straight away. It's like little things do not behave like big things at all, and that shatters your view of the world. You know, th things can be in two places at once. I mean, so no, it's, worth, it's worth saying that the, the, we know how the theory of big things, the world of big things, emerges from those rules. I mean, we spend a lot so of time... You're talking about the world of big, big things and oh, Newtonian well, physics. So, so and why don't things. I hop? Why don't I explore the entire universe now? Well, well, I'm saying well, I mean, see a lot of money yeah, on that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a license for yes, Jeremy Hobson. Politics. But the reason for that, the reason that basically big things stay where you put them and don't just hop around, it is known in the theory that that behaviour emerges, and it's actually to do with interference, which is another way of like property. And that's there's a, a, a nice way of thinking, thinking about this. If it were the case that that, uh, that that me standing here, there was a definite instance of me, right? That every atom in my body, every particle in every atom in my body, occupied a definite point in space at some instant in time. If that were true, so that that that, that I think you, you would say constitutes a definite me. If that were true, then in the next instant I would explode. <laughs> so, so my very, yeah, very confidence, you know, the, the, fact, the fact that I, I don't explode and that I'm here is actually testament in quantum mechanics. That's explained by saying that there are, for every particle in my body, it's actually in several different places at the same time. And because of that, I look like this, right? I have this, uh, this kind of emergent structure. So, kind of, yeah. Well, Why don't we just fall through the floor? Well, that's another question. That's a really good question. We're talking about these particles being point-like. Mm. Right? Well, the, the, it's just as well that they're point-like because it, it does mean that we can get the Big Bang to work, right? That everything, all the galaxies, all the billions of stars in every galaxy can fit in a pinhead. Well, a moment's thought, then it, it, whatever they're built out of must be tiny, those things, right? So it's just as well that, that we think they're point-like, right? It really means that we can get everything into, into nothing, right? We can squash everything down. So, the, but it does, and then when we learn about atoms, so Ernest Rutherford's experiments uh, at the turn of the last century, uh, which demonstrated that atoms are essentially empty space, that uh, if you actually looked inside of an atom, then, the, and, and, and so that the nucleus was about the size of a pea, say, so if we zoomed into an atom, so the nucleus were all the masses about the size of a pea, then the electrons which orbit the nucleus are orbiting at distances of a few hundred metres away, and they're like the tiny specks, that's like a pea in the Albert Hall, it's empty. It's 
uh, I think I only 90%, <laughs> empty space by volume. 